Good afternoon. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to the show. This afternoon, David Suzuki virtually voted one of the top Canadians of all time. But there's another story to David Suzuki that many of you may not know. A story that goes back to his early childhood. A story of racism, oppression, and blatant racial profiling. Not one of Canada's finer moments in any sense. And World War II happened. And suddenly, my mother and father, who were born and raised in Canada, had never been to Japan, were treated as enemy aliens. Under the War Measures Act, we were selected only because we were racially distinct. This didn't happen with the Germans or the Italians, who were born in Canada, only the Japanese. We were then deprived of all rights, thrown into camps. Our possessions were basically taken over and then ultimately sold for next to nothing. And the money that was obtained was used to pay for our maintenance in the camps. This afternoon, a Canadian legend, a Canadian icon, David Suzuki. Right now on Brent Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Canadian icon David Suzuki. And this afternoon, we're going to be speaking about the individual things we can each do in our own lives to help reduce our global footprint. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. What are some of the things as individuals we can do to help reduce our carbon footprint? Well, there are a lot of things. We've got used to a, a lot of convenience, and in many ways, the way we're living it runs counter to what our bodies need. For example, we eat far too much meat, and meat has become a major health problem. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what's in the meat. I mean, if you are going to e eat meat, for heaven's sake, uh, try to get organic meat, but uh, we, we eat far too much meat, and cutting back on meat has a huge impact because meat is such a high food intensive uh, product it takes about 15 uh, pounds of grain to make one pound of cow for example and uh, you know if you mm -hmm. give up as as we say at the foundation just give up meat one day one day a week and every Catholic can remember when, you know, every Friday, oh my goodness, I can't eat meat today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a huge sacrifice. And yet if, if people do make small steps, it can have a huge impact if enough of us do that. So I focus on three areas. It's what you eat, it's how you move, transportation, and where you live, your home. And when you look at that, you find there are many, many simple ways that not only uh, are healthier for the planet, they're healthier for our bodies, and you can save money. Uh, when you look at your house, for example, we recommend that you check every little crack and, and opening that allows us to take either our heated air in the winter or our cooled air in the summer and let it leak out. Every one of us has, on average, if you collected all the little leaks, a hole about a meter square. That's how much ultimately space there is for air to rush out of our homes. So if you insulate your homes and, and fill in the, the cracks and all that, we say try to save 10 to 15 percent of your energy bill and you'll make money. So it's simple things like that. Uh, we say if you're going to buy a new household appliance, look for the, uh, the energy guide and look for the most energy efficient one. A refrigerator today you can buy that's 85 percent more efficient than a refrigerator, say, 20 years ago. So there are lots of improvements in energy efficiency that will save us money and uh, reduce our footprint. So, you know, I, I wrote a book with David Boyd called The, uh, the Green mm -hmm. Guide, mm -hmm. and it's filled with suggestions about things to do. And they're in your home, and they're in your food habits, and in your transportation. So we've got to use, we've got to do a lot more walking. Our bodies evolved to walk not plunk our, our fat bottoms into the car to drive five blocks, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's what we do, you know? Absolutely, I'm and, sure we do. Uh, we have a real obesity problem because we're not treating the body the way it should be treated. I'm sorry, folks, it was made to move. It was made to exercise, and there are lots of ways to incorporate that. Uh, you don't have to go to a gym, you know? It's just a matter of climbing the stairs rather than taking elevators and walking to the store rather than driving. Just simple simple things on a day-to-day -day basis makes that such Absolutely. a difference they all add up indeed they do um, but just, you know in in the end it's got to be far deeper than this we are living in a way that is so completely out of sync 
with the planet or the biosphere that we have become a very destructive agent. Now, I know a lot of people like to say, oh, it's population, there are too many of us. It is true, there are too many of us. But you can't just compare us with, say, people in India or China. It's the amount that we consume per person. So you have to, if you want to compare Canada's population with India or China, you've got to multiply by 20 to 40, and then that will give us the Indian equivalents of our population. You want to compare us to Bangladesh or Somalia, you got to multiply by 80 or 100 or 80, and then you get an idea, oh my goodness, we are the ones that are overpopulated. And it's our consumptive habits that are making us a very, very, uh, he giving us a heavy footprint. So consumption, the way we're living, is completely out of sync with the rest of the planet. So the challenge for me is, We've got to see ourselves in a different relationship with the planet. If we think that we're in charge and that the planet is there for us to use as we wish, then we're toast. We are absolutely mm. hooped. There are estimated between 10 and 100 million species on Earth. Nobody knows how many there are, but I think a reasonable number is about 30 million species. And those species are absolutely critical for our survival. They make the soil to grow our food on. They cleanse the water when it percolates through the, the soil. They create the atmosphere that we depend on. You know, they, they perform services that without them we die. And yet we're destroying so much of that web of living things. And we just think we're so smart we can take over the oceans and take over the land and continue to feed our economy. But the economy depends on nature's productivity for our lumber and our fish and our air and our water. And yet economists, they call those things externalities. They don't care. So it means that you and I, in, in the middle of winter in Canada, can buy a fresh apple for less than a dollar shipped all the way from New Zealand. Now you say, how the hell can we afford to buy that apple? Well, the reason is we don't include the ecological cost of growing these plants way the hell around the other side of the world and then producing all the greenhouse gases to ship them up to Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal. Uh, we just think, oh, well, Buck, I'll get this apple. If you included the real earth cost of what we're doing, that apple would probably cost about $200. People say, well, we couldn't afford it. Exactly. Because getting that apple for a dollar is now destroying the very life support systems of the planet. Well, this begs a big question then. What in the hell is the matter with us as a species that we want to commit suicide on exactly. this global level? What's wrong with exactly. us psychologically? I think there are a number of things. In 1900, there were one and a half billion people in the world. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of people around the world lived in rural village communities. There were only 16 cities with more than a million people in 1900. Most people lived in small villages or towns, and most of us were involved in some form of agriculture. We were farmers, and when you're a farmer, you know damned well weather and climate are everything as far as your livelihood goes. You know that the amount of snow in the winter is directly related to how much moisture is in the soil in the summer. You know that not all insects are harmful, that most of them are useful as pollinators or they eat other insects. Uh, so that you don't want to kill every insect. You know that certain plants take nitrogen out of the fix it as fertilizer. So I believe that farmers, when you're farmers, you are deeply embedded in the natural world and you know you depend on nature. Come ahead a hundred years. Now the vast majority of people in the industrialized countries and over half of all people in the poor countries now live in huge cities. In the year 2000, there were 6 billion people, four times as many people, but there were over 300 cities with more than a million people. The 10 largest in the year 2000 all had more than 11 million people. So suddenly in 100 years, we went from being a farming animal to a city animal. And in a city, we're cut off from nature. And the economy becomes our highest priority because living in a city, you've got to buy everything. And so we now have this economic imperative and we get to the situation where the Prime Minister of Canada, who is supposed to be leading us into the future for four years, has said to do anything about global warming will destroy the economy. I'm not going to do anything. 
How the hell can he talk about the economy as if it's more important than the very air that we breathe, the atmosphere that creates weather and climate? This is what this perplexes is absolutely me. absolutely suicidal. Completely. Uh, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. Well, as I say, I really think it's because most of us are urban dwellers and we don't see the connection any longer. And I think that there's a real profound perceptual shift. And in focusing on the economy, we don't see any longer that the very things that we're doing with the economy are destroying a future for our children. And I think the urgent thing now is that we've got to start thinking harder about our children and the kind of world that we're leaving for them. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com Maybe that will be the thing to do. It will start thinking about our children. You know... I'm in Sudbury right now, and Sudbury, as everybody knows that's listening, is noted for their mining. When I first came here two years ago from Montreal, I came expecting to find a barren landscape. This is what I was always told. But there has been a substantial regreening force here in the city, and the place is stunningly beautiful now. David, is there a chance that industry and people can find harmony and actually live together? Well, we have to. I mean, the reality is if we don't, we're hooped. So, you know, a lot of environmentalists, we've grown up fighting. When, when I start talking to companies like Walmart, a lot of environmentalists get very, very upset hmm. because they believe that we're dealing with the enemy. The reality is that Sudbury's success, and it is a success story, and I brag about it whenever I can, believe me, was, was created, I believe, out of necessity. But it was also, you have to remember, for years and years, environmentalists fought INCO, and INCO kept threatening, oh, we're going to have to shut down, we're going to go out of business, we're going to move to a different city, you know, you're going to destroy us. And only by fighting and fighting, finally, the government passed laws over the screaming objections of INCO. And guess what? Once they were forced to do it, they started to make money by taking stuff out of the stacks. And now they started bragging, and I don't begrudge them bragging, but I don't want people to forget that those pesky environmentalists dragged INCO to the table and made them begin to conform until the company saw that there were enormous benefits. Not only would they make money, but they could brag about it and improve their image. And now I think there are opportunities in the mines, you know, in terms of the, the heat that might be used to grow things. Mm-hmm. And, and the greening story is a very, very exciting one that tells you nature it can be very forgiving. We have to give her a chance in, in places like Sudbury and then lighten our own footprint. And nature, we don't deserve how forgiving nature is. But the one thing nature needs is time. And you can't just suddenly say, oh, I've found religion on the environment. Tomorrow we're going to have a nice greener planet. It's going to take centuries if we're going to try to undo what we've already done. What are some of the major red flags, not only around the world, but right now in Canada? For me, for, I live in British Columbia, mm-hmm. and British Columbia always advertised on its license plate, beautiful B.C. But I was shocked four years ago when I flew over northern British Columbia and found the forest has turned from green to bright red. And the reason is it's not cold enough in the winter anymore to kill the mountain pine beetle, which is a parasite about the size of a grain of rice. But because they're not killed in the winter, they have exploded and now destroyed $65 billion of pine trees in B.C. And now they're so numerous that they have blown over the Rocky Mountains, have started into the boreal forest in Alberta, and I don't see any way that we'll be able to control them. They will go right across the boreal uh, all the way to Newfoundland. It's a horrific, like the Inuit in the Arctic, British Columbia is at the forefront of seeing the consequences of climate change. Fishermen here mm-hmm. know that the, the sockeye salmon have plummeted in the Fraser River. The largest sockeye population in the world has plummeted to less than a million fish this year, where we expected over 10 million, and the traditional yields were over 100 million, so we've dropped you know, 99% 
And we know that sockeye are very temperature sensitive. We know the oceans are filled with humble squid, a very, very predatory animal that has come from the southern waters be up here because the waters are getting warmer. We know that there were these horrific forest fires around Kelowna, and an extreme storm just trashed Stanley Park. Several thousand trees were knocked down. We know it's happening because we can see it. And Canadians better understand there's probably no industrialized country in the world more vulnerable to climate change than Canada. We are a northern country, and we know the warming at the poles is going on much more than at the temperate regions. Inuit have been telling us for years that climate is warming. We have the longest marine coastline of any country in the world. And when water gets warmer, it expands. Sea level rise is going to affect Canada more than any nation on the planet. And if we talk about economics, well, what about the economics of agriculture, forestry, fisheries, tourism, that are all very climate sensitive? If our prime minister really cares about the economy, he should be focused on climate change as one of his highest priorities. And he's not. And I think Canadians better damn well think about that. We cannot afford another election to go on without climate change being at the absolute center of the public's concern. Have you any personal aspirations to run? No. I'm an old man. I'm, I'm too old. How old are you? Well, I'm going to be 74 next month. I have nothing but admiration for anyone who runs for office. It's a very tough job. There is no way an old fart like me could ever have the stamina for a very, very tough job. But that doesn't mean I'm not political. I mean, everything I do has political ramifications, and I believe very strongly that we all have to be involved in the political process. And dropping out and not voting is not the way to go, and that's more and more Canadians... Are, have given up because they are cynical, they see the bullshit that goes on, but this is a time we need more democracy. And what that means is you got to get involved. It's too much of a luxury to say, ah, oh, they're just a bunch of whatever and I'm not going to bother taking part. Whatever is done or not done in the coming years in Ottawa will have very little impact on old guys like me. But what is or is not done in the next few years will reverberate through the lives of our children and grandchildren. So we've got to be political at this time. I know you're close to the Haida Nation. What can we learn from Aboriginals? You know, I'm not a First Nations. I never will be. But there is so much to learn from First Nations. And the most important thing is very simple stuff. It's about our relationship with the land. They have taught me that the land to the First Nations, and you know, you just have to go to meet an urban native, and you say, oh yeah, well, who are you? Right away they'll tell you where they come from, because their whole identity, even in the middle of a city, That's is right. tied up in that connection to the land. The land is what makes them who they are. They call the earth their mother, and they don't mean that in a poetic or a, or a metaphoric way. They mean it literally, that the Precisely. earth, mother earth, Mm -hmm. gives us the air that, that inflates us, the water, the food that we eat. We are created out of the earth, and our relationship with the earth then has got to change because we're destroying the very things that keep us alive. And, you know, people say, oh, the earth is in trouble or the planet's in trouble. That's a lot of baloney. The earth isn't in, in trouble at all. The earth will go on spinning away long after we're gone, but the web of living things on earth is in deep trouble now because of us. And the web is what we depend on for our survival. So it's ultimately suicidal what we are doing. You're absolutely right. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com There's a lot of folks out there that think that they could never achieve anything here, either by the color of their skin, where they came from, perhaps sexual orientation. I would love it if you could tell folks the story of your parents and yourself and what you've achieved since then. 
You know, that's a big story, but I'll try to make it short. My grandparents came to Canada in the early 1900s. They were very, very poor. They came to what they regarded as a savage country, very unsophisticated, uncivilized country. But they came here because they thought they could make money. They had no intention of staying in Canada. They just wanted to make money and then head off home to Japan. Thank goodness they had children who said, we're not going to go to that foreign country. We're Canadians. And even though Canada has been an incredibly racist society, starting with the treatment of the first peoples that were here, through Chinese and Japanese and all the various people of color that have come here, this has been a very racist country and continues to be. But I believe that we always have to work hard to get rid of it to change the country, and that's what we're allowed to do through a thing called democracy. And the changes that have happened in my life have been enormous. But my grandparents came, they had children, and my parents were born, one in 1909 and the other in 1911. They, although they spoke Japanese fluently, they had never been to Japan. They went to school here in Canada, and they only regarded themselves as Canadians. So they had come through the Depression and were starting out. They started a family in the 1930s. That's when my sisters and I were born. And World War II happened. And suddenly, my mother and father, who were born and raised in Canada, had never been to Japan, were treated as enemy aliens. Under the War Measures Act, we were selected only because we were racially distinct. This didn't happen with the Germans or the Italians, who were born in Canada, only the Japanese. We were then deprived of all rights, thrown into camps. Our possessions were basically taken over and then ultimately sold for next to nothing. And the money that was obtained was used to pay for our maintenance in the camps. So for my mother and father, who were in their early 30s, this was absolutely shattering because they were Canadians. Mm -hmm. They knew no other country had suddenly said, you have no rights, and moved us into camps. It was a very, very bitter pill for them. When the war came to an end, British Columbia said, we don't want any more Japs in this province. And so they gave us two choices. Give up your citizenship and we'll give you a one-way ticket to Japan or get out of British Columbia. There were 22,000 Japanese Canadians in these camps. Most of them were so angry that over 95% of them signed up and said, we're going to Japan. For most of them, it wasn't going back. It was going to Japan for the first time. My mother and father said, we're Canadians. We've never been there. We're staying. So we shipped out and ended up in southern Ontario, first in Leamington. We moved to Leamington in 1946. And at that time, Leamington was a town of about 10,000 people. And the boast of people in Leamington was no colored person has ever stayed in Leamington after sunset. Oh my God. And we, yeah, we were the first colored family to move into Leamington. And for a while, people were very nervous, but in the end, I had a wonderful time. We lived there for four years. But we ended up in London, Ontario. My mother and father said, if you're going to succeed in this country, you have to be willing to work 10 times harder than a white person. And education is the key. The one avenue that's open to people of color is to go to school and get a good education. So for me, if my dad was mad at me for something, he didn't threaten to hit me. He just said, look, you keep that up and I'm going to pull you out of school and put you to work. That was my biggest fear because education for me was everything. It was the key to, to getting out of the poverty that we knew. Now, I was very, very fortunate in that working hard was not a, a problem and I did well in school. And I ended up getting a, a very big scholarship to a college in the United States, one of the top small liberal arts schools in the United States. And the scholarship was for more than my father earned in a year. And in 1954, that was $1,500. But Amherst College, the school I went to, believed that foreign students added to the education and the, the world view of American students. And so they valued foreign students to come to provide an expansion of the education of the American students. And it really upsets me that in Canada today, we're using foreign students and gouging them for money. And rather than seeing that they add to the education of our students, we just are attracting as many as we can who are going to pay the top dollar to come to our universities. And I've always been grateful to Americans for valuing the perspective of, of a foreign student and giving me an education that I couldn't get in Canada at that time. So I've been very, very lucky.
I agree with you completely about foreign students. One of the things I love about universities and that whole milieu is the fact that there's faces from everywhere around the world and ideas from everywhere around the world. Of course. And then you're make, making friends and all of a sudden the barriers are dropping left, right and center. I think the most important thing is to realize we learn how to look at the world through our, our own culture and our, our values. But if you grow up in a, in a country like India or Tibet or Russia, or they see the world in a very different way. And to me, an education is opening your eyes to the fact that yours isn't the only culture or yours isn't the most advanced or the best. But there are many other ways of looking at the world, and they add to your ability to, to see the world. David, I'll put one final question to you. You virtually have the complete Canadian university population listening to you right now. What would you say to them? You know, people say to me, gee, I care about the uh, environment. What can I do? And my answer is, follow your heart. If you're a great writer, if you're a great artist, if you're a painter, if you're like history or ancient Greece, follow what you, you love because you'll only do well with what you have a passion for. And then make that as green as possible, whatever you do. We shouldn't have environmentalists whose job is to save the environment. Everybody is a part of the environment. All of us are a part of the the biosphere and the health of the biosphere has got to be our highest priority. And it shouldn't be a political issue any more than it should be a biologist issue or a scientist issue. This is every one of us. So follow your passion so that you do whatever you do as well as you can, but always incorporate that perspective that says whatever we do, we've got to take into account the environmental implications. Folks, if you're just joining us, our guest today is David Suzuki, and I want to thank him so much for taking the time out of his day to join us and um, speak with us. Also, David's just getting over a cold, and I want to thank him again for taking the time, uh, even though he's a, a little bit under Thanks the a lot for letting me mouth off as much as I did. I much appreciate it, especially the part about okay. your parents. Take okay. care, my friend. So I sincerely want to thank David Suzuki for coming on the show today and telling us about his early childhood, as well as ways we can all reduce our carbon footprint. I want to thank you all for listening. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>